listening to Radio Maria, Christian Boys in your home. We're not presenting the show. This is the promised Messiah, Judaism, with Mr. Roy Shulman. Hi, this is Roy Shulman, and welcome again to Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism, the show on Radio Maria that celebrates the Jewish roots of the Catholic faith, or seen the other way around, that celebrates the completion, the fulfillment, the full realization of the promise of Judaism in the Catholic Church and her sacraments. Uh, thank you for joining us today. If you have uh, been with us a number of times in the past, you'll know that one of my favorite things to do on this show is to invite on another enthusiastic Jewish entrant into the Catholic Church to talk about how he or she found their way to post-Messianic Judaism, so to speak, that is the Catholic Church, and also to talk about the, uh, well, two other things actually. One is the relationship between Judaism and the Catholic Church, and the other is um, just what it means to go from being in the uh, kind of mapless reaches of, um, of not knowing the truth to having the truth so beautifully and fully laid out in black and white before us in the Catholic Church and in its teaching. And I, a few weeks ago, I was uh, giving a talk in, in the Chicago area, and I had the great good fortune to be introduced to another enthusiastic Jewish entrant into the Catholic Church. And I invited him to come on the show, and he's on today, so I'm very grateful to have him. Are you there, Lyle? I am here. So I guess we can start with the normal question, what's a nice Jewish boy like you doing in a place like this? <laughs> Having the time of his life, that's for sure. Roy, you are talking to a very uh, blessed individual, blessed beyond anything he could ever earn, ever deserve, or ever be worthy of. And it's that way because of Jesus. It's not because of anything I have done. It's only because of his goodness and his love for me. And that's a, it's a debt that I can never repay. I don't care what I had. I can never repay it. I don't care how much money I've got. I can't repay that. Because only out of his goodness did he do this to me. And it's been the time of my life. It's been basically the great adventure. You know, it, for a Jewish boy to uh, to do this, first of all, I'm the only person in my family who's ever done anything like this. No one has ever has. If you or anybody at any time before I accepted Christ would have said to me, Lyle, you know something? You will accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. My response to you would have been, how much money do you want to lose? Because I'd take any bet, any odds, it would never happen. But it wouldn't for this reason. You see, people are people. Whether they're Jewish, whether they're, they're not Jewish, some people are good, some people are not. And what I, so some people are examples. Sometimes you can see somebody in the, you know, that, that person, I can see the way they live. But the people that I saw, the people that I associated with, were just like anybody else in that, if you look at the Gentile world, the people were, they go to uh, the church on Christmas, they celebrate Christmas, Easter. But during the year, they're not living it. They're not living it. There's, there's no examples that I have seen. There's nothing to say, I want to be there. Not a thing. And the only thing in my working career before the last job I had where at that point, in my walk with, uh, that's where I accepted Jesus during that time. But before that, there were two men in my life. These were Christian. I didn't know what uh, denominations uh, meant, so I thought a Catholic and a Protestant were pretty close. You know, it didn't make much of a difference, whatever you wanted to be, because I didn't know any better. And so I wasn't with them long enough. Although one man, I tell you, his, his example to me stood out. Because here, when I was out of college, I'm 22, and he came to work. I was working in a men's furnishings department in a department store. And at that time, he came to work for us. All right? Well, I'm the manager. He's my uh, worker. He was a combat Marine in World War II. The man's name was Herb. And that, I mean, he was in the South Pacific. I mean, he knew what battle was. And he was telling me some of the stories that he had had, the experiences he had. 
So this man understood. But if I said, he called me Brother Lyle, I'd call him Brother Herb. And we used to go back and forth like that. I said, Herb, would you do this for me? I need to get this done, this done. Not a doubt. Not a doubt. He'd do it. He wouldn't question you. The other is, I got this to do. I got a customer, you know, whatever excuse. He was different. His life was different. But unfortunately, the way things worked out, it didn't, our paths could not continue on the same path. We just couldn't do it. But then, too, there was a time in my life where things weren't going well at all. You know, you talk about recessions. Well, you know, the recessions were, they happened years ago, too. And I can remember that I had three jobs in three years. Honestly, God, every year I lost one job. Every next year, one job. Next year, I thought I had a target. I swear, I thought I had a target on my back, and the, the blind man could hit me. I couldn't be missed. And I couldn't understand. I mean, it wasn't that I wasn't doing good work. They liked me. They wanted me to stay. But there's no work to do, no business. And it's just a business decision. That's all. It's simple. It's what had to be. It had to be. And so one then we, I was out of work one time for nine months. I mean, that was tough. Because, you know, you got to keep slugging ahead. you got to keep uh, getting your contacts and, and all that kind of stuff. And you can't get discouraged. you just got to keep going. But I was discouraged. And... My dad and I went to the cemetery one day, and we were going to visit my the, the relatives' graves there. I was very frustrated, really was. I, I shook my fist at God, I really did, and I said, "I don't know what you want from me." I said, "I don't know. I know I'm not the best person. I'll never tell you I am, I said, but I'm not the worst. If I could understand what you want, if I could only talk to you." there was silence no answer and that bothered me but there was no answer and then my mom who was sick for a number of years she she had an ongoing illness with her heart and all this and that so I mean it wasn't like uh, you know this was it wasn't an easy situation for her and the last time I remember she went to the hospital she said I'm dying and I said come on mom you know who made you a doctor You've gotten through before, we'll get you through now. Well, the first day, things were good. That's great. Second day in the hospital, still holding their own. Things were good. The third day, we were supposed to go there, Dad and I, and she said, don't come right now. Uh, they're moving me to another room, so just uh, come by later. Give them time to move me in. All right, fine. So I get up there, and I see the, I see a doctor. I said, Doc, this, how's my mom doing? Oh, she, she's doing good. Don't worry about a thing. Everything will be fine. Well, yeah, that's great news, right? Well, I go in the room. She's connected to everything but the kitchen sink. And I don't know what to make of it. I really didn't know. Uh, I'm talking to her, and then Dad is a little bit behind me, so he came in. And the nurse says to me, what should we, you can't be in here. I said, why not? I said, it's my mother. What do you mean I can't be in here? She says, your mother's very sick. Well, like, that's not like, you know, that's not the news. She's in the hospital. What you doing there? And um, I, I said, explain yourself. What, what, what do you mean? She said, your mother's very sick. She said, what should we do if something happens? And now I got the idea. And I said, you do everything that you possibly can. And I said, you spare nothing. You do it all. So she said, okay, we will. And she said, there's a lounge on the floor here. Just go down. We weren't there 10 minutes. I heard cold blue. And I went out. You know, sorry. I knew what it was. That was it. So, but what hurts about all of that when the nurse gives you a plastic bag with everything in it, it represents somebody you care for. That's it. It's gone. That was a problem. So I get all this. She died on Christmas Eve. 
1991, Christmas Eve. That date's important. I'll get to that in a little bit. When we were, when she was alive, there's something that we could both feel, but never at the same time. Something cold would touch us, whether it was on our feet, whether it was on our bodies. We never could tell what that was. I mean, it was cold. You would know it. But there's nothing you can explain it. You throw it open, the door, the windows, nothing, everything, everything is what it should be. But it was there. And I've been feeling that. But then I felt something that was a little different. I felt something, this was like the summer months now. And when I'm coming home and I want to go through my mail, I say, you know, it's kind of warmer now. I just want to turn the air conditioner down. Then a gentleness touched me. I never experienced that before. A nice gentle, I didn't have to do anything. I was okay. And then one time I experienced something that was in front of me that was so hot. I, I couldn't be near it. I had to back off. Uh, it was, if I look back, I know what they were. This was the Holy Spirit. I know that now. But back then I had no idea. So I'm telling my father this because I have no clue and he has no clue. We're both together clueless, clueless as we can be. But then there was a program that I used to watch on television, and it was an interesting meeting. And what sightings tried to do was explain supernatural things. Okay, well, I just watched it because it was interesting. And I watched one episode of sightings. And in this episode, it said, it described people trying to get a ghost out of a house, and they felt something cold touch them. I said, well, I can relate to that. So I got, I, I got to figure. I got to, I got to do this. I got to, I got to look into this. See, my mom was dad wanted to put her in the mausoleum, and he, he wanted to do that for good reason. No matter what the weather, we could visit, and so we did. No matter what the weather, park in front of the door, go inside. It's covered and we could visit. And the chapel we had to go into, because this was like, uh, on, let's say the first floor, and then my mom was down one floor. It had a huge stained glass mural of Jesus holding a sheep. When I say huge, it's probably about 15 feet wide, and about 10 feet high. Huge. Beautiful. Of course, he's holding a sheep. I, I don't know if it's the lost sheep <laughs> Or what if the sheep you know, took a wrong turn and he's coming back, made a U-turn? I don't know anything. He's holding a sheep. So one day, Dad and I go, are going in this chapel, and Dad says to me, you know, he said, I asked Jesus to watch over Mom for me. And I said, what? I said, we don't believe in him. Why would you do this? He said, I know, I know, but, you know, Jesus is here and Mom's downstairs. Okay. For whatever reason, that thought stuck with me. For whatever reason. So one day, there's a, there was a couch there. Dad was talking to somebody. I looked at that mural, and I said these words. I said, Jesus, I don't know what you said. I don't know what you did. I do know you walked the face of the earth. I said, but if you are the Messiah, watch over my mother for me. those words and more than I could ever imagine. It didn't have to open the door to my heart much more. Just a bit. That's all it took. That's all it took. So one day, this was the weekend, I was going to go to the library. I was going to check out what these spirits meant, what was going on. So this gentleness would always touch me at night. Always, in the in your night, the afternoon, always. But on Saturday morning, for the very first time, this gentleness touches me. Sunday night, Saturday night, again. Sunday morning, again. Sunday morning, I'm going to the, I'm going to the library. I'm going to do some research. And Dad said to me, what are you wasting your time for? I said, you're not going to find anything there. And I said, well, I've got to do something because I can't explain anything that's going on. So anyway, I'm going through there. 
And there's a whole bunch of books. I think I've looked through every book and said there was on the shelves. I'm standing between these two stacks. I mean, there's books and books of witchcraft, whatever. You name it, there's a book on it. But there's, there's a whole bunch of books of witchcraft, and I just decided to pull one out. I didn't think it was witchcraft, but I don't know what I'm dealing with. There's a piece of paper that was in there, and it fell out, and I read it. It was a really long note. I mean, it was the whole page. But I read it. And basically, you could summarize what was there in one sentence. You will not find your answer here, but you will in the Lord Jesus Christ. It didn't mean anything to me. Not then. But I figured, well, look, you know, maybe it helps somebody. I just put the uh, the note back in, and it could help somebody else. I'm back home. It's 1 o'clock. Early afternoon. I said, Dad, what do you, you know, want to talk about what do you want to eat for supper? Yeah, I don't know. We'll, we'll see later. You know, I, got, I was working around the house, and he said, just come back later. We'll talk. And then I said, Roy, I said these words that you can't believe. I'd ever, I never could believe I'd say them. I said, Dad, you know, I believe that if Jesus that, that if Jesus came today, the rabbis would not accept him, and they would not, because they would be afraid that if they did, their stature would go down and his would go up. That's what it was. In reality, that's what it was. And when I said those words, this gentleness touches me. It's like saying, yes, yes, you understand. You understand. Well, Dad said, we, we decided I'd come back to, see, to talk to Dad later on about what we wanted, about 3 o'clock. I've been in the house, I'm doing work, and this idea is now in my mind. It's going around with a, with a power that I've never experienced in my life. I can't imagine what this is like. Three o'clock, we're together, we're talking. Now, I don't know three o'clock is the mercy hour. I have no idea what three o'clock is. But as I'm talking to my dad, I said, Dad, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah, that he came and he will come again. And when I said those words, this gentleness touches me again. And it's saying, yes, yes, you understand. You understand. And I could tell you, I felt a joy so great. I was flying. I mean, I didn't need an airplane. If you said to me, Lyle, let's go on pilgrimage. I'm going to buy the land ticket. You know, I'm going to buy the airfare. You just got to pay for the land. I would have told you, Roy, I don't need it. I can fly over there on my own. That's how high I was with joy. I couldn't contain this. I have a Christian neighbor next across the hall, a widow. I told her next door to me, there was a, a Christian lady married to a Jewish man. I had to tell her. But I'm running out of people to tell. So the next day, I, had, I was going to work. Now, this is a Sunday. I want you to understand that. Remember I told you my mom passed away on Christmas Eve in 91. This is August 30th of 1992 at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Nine months later, when do you have a baby? In nine months. I was the baby. I can, can't prove it because this is a spiritual thing. Some things you can prove, some things you can't. But I can tell you what I would believe so strongly. I believe that my mom, when she went to see Jesus, and I'm sure she saw the Blessed Virgin, and I'm sure she would have said, Mama Mary, my son needs to know about yours in nine months. So I went to the office the next day. There was one woman there. We talked religion occasionally. She's the only one I talked religion to. I didn't know anybody else who could talk it even. And she happened to be Catholic. I went in her office. Did she get in about 11 o'clock? I couldn't wait to talk to her. I said, I, gotta, I have to share this. I can't keep it in. And so I went in her office, and she says, what can I do for her? She was on the phone. And I said to her, Cassie, I said, I believe. She looked at me. Said, what did you say? I said, I believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Why she almost fell out of her chair. I mean, I never saw a person almost fall out of a chair, but she did. She said to me, you go sit in this chair over, this, over there. I'm going to talk to you when we're done. She did. That was the beginning. That was the beginning because 
although she didn't understand everything, she, as, as the Lord had given me different spiritual gifts, she began to see. She tried to direct me. And the first thing she thought of uh, was Jews for Jesus. Of course, she didn't know they were Protestant, neither did I. I didn't know what was going on. So I decided to go over to Jews for Jesus. And they're, they're, they're really nice people there. They really were. They're welcoming and all this and that. And this uh, the man who led it, man, his name was Jan, a really great guy, good teacher. And the, the, the thing, so I'm, I'm going there, and I'm listening to these people. And I've been going there for, for quite a while, making friends and all this and that. Um, I went to an Assemblies of God church even. I liked them. They were, they were good people. I read what they stood for, and it was fine. You know, I, I, I could agree with that. But then I was talking to one man over there, and this guy had two kids. And he wanted to send these kids to, for religious education. So he went to one church, and he didn't like what they told him. He, he's arguing he's arguing philosophy with them. Then he went to another one. And it's going back and forth. He can't find a church to send the kids to because they don't quite believe what he wants because he's his own, basically, he is his own pope. He makes his own rules and whatever he thinks. It's what it is. It's good. Okay. So Jan one day said, you know, he said to me, I well, said the whole group because he was it's just a teaching, find a church that you like and go there. But there was a question that hit me. The question was, how many different churches are there? And how do you know you're in the one that's really teaching you what it really is? And yeah, I didn't know the answer to that right there. So as my friend Cassie began to see the different gifts that the Lord had given me, she said, I don't understand everything that you're going through. But she said, is there a Catholic church near your house? And I said, yeah, there is. And uh, she said, ask you if they got a charismatic prayer group there. Just call up. Well, I did. And it turns out they did have one. No, I, I didn't know charismatic for a manual transmission. You know, I, it's a word I never heard in my life. What do I know? But anyway, he called up. And they did have one. And they put me in contact with the group leader. And I, I went to her house. And so when I got there, not only was I made to feel welcome, but one thing was also there. They understood me. I could talk to them, and they could understand what I was saying. It was like, you know, like you're, you're talking to a foreign language. Now it's not foreign anymore. And I could see. But I'm going there, and what, what, I went there for a while. I'm going there now every, all the time. So what happened was that they invited me to a healing mass. And I didn't feel comfortable at first. Not at first. I just declined. It's okay. If you, whenever you're ready, it's okay. And I'm telling my father all this. Of course, he can't understand it. whatever happened to me. Why would I ever do this? He said, I think you're going down the wrong road. He said, why don't you call the rabbi and talk to him? I did. I did call the rabbi. And when I talked to the rabbi, the rabbi said to me, Lyle, he said, get this out of your head. Get, don't take up fishing. And get, your, <laughs> get your mind set on something else. Forget this nonsense. You don't forget you don't forget what's going on and what, you, what you're experiencing. You can't do that. In any event, one day I did go to a healing mass. I saw, I, I, when the mass began, you know, and then I heard the first reading. The first reading was Isaiah. I had heard Isaiah in the synagogue. I mean, this is new, not new to me. This is what's there. I heard the, the psalm chanted. I heard the melody chanted. I look at the priest. He's got a he's got a, a stole on. It's a prayer shawl. It's a palace. And where do they get it from? Got it from us. We're Jewish. They took it. The Pope wears it's a ghetto. It's a the Yarmulke. This is what he wears, a kippah. It's the same thing. Roy, I knew I was home. I knew I was home. This is what I should where I should have been. And this is where I was. And I can tell you, that started, that was the adventure, beginning. I knew that was the church I had to go to. I remember one day I went to Mass on a Sunday. Well, Dad didn't like it. And of course, I could, how can he tell me I'm an adult that I can't go? 
He said, I don't like you going. They went to the Lord in prayer. He said, Lord, he can't stop me. He said, for now. He said, back off. Don't do it. Listen to your dad. And I did. Then there was a healing mass coming up. But I said, Dad, you know, this group I belong to, we have a, uh, a mass. And what they do is they lift up the names of the people who are sick to people to be prayed for. And you're sick. You could use the prayer. You know, I, if I went there, I, I could lift your name up. He said, that, that's a good idea. You, why don't you go? I listened to the Lord. He made the way. And from that point on, I went to Mass every Sunday. And until I was ready to go into RCIA. And I liked RCIA. I, I, when, when I was had my baptism and, and confirmation and all that at Easter, I was the guy up there smiling. I, I was having the time of my life. This was fun. I enjoyed it. Being, <laughs> it was a great time. And uh, my friends afterwards took me out uh, for dinner that night. Friends from my prayer group. And we had a great dinner. And uh, it's been the adventure. It's the adventure. He has taken me places that I've never ever thought I would ever go to do things I could never dream to do. To talk about him to people. This is fun. Roy, this is fun for me. I could do this. I could do this all the time. Great. In fact, uh, it, 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 um, I, at one time I even thought of being a priest. Except in my diocese, I was too old. In the diocese of uh, Chicago, they didn't want me. Because the Lord came to me later in life. But the Lord had a better plan for me. Later he gave me a wife. And that's a wonderful gift that he gave me. So, uh, yeah, he, he, gave me, he gave me a good gift. So I am blessed beyond what anybody can imagine. Amen. Blessed. Amen. Um, I am. I'm glad I don't really have to interrupt because you've come to a kind of a natural break. But uh, we're almost halfway through the show. So we, what we usually do is take a short musical break halfway through the show, and and then continue at the other side of the break. And it is a live uh, call-in show. So if anyone wants to call in. It's uh, very convenient to call in during the break because then when we come out of the break, I just look to see if there are any calls, and if there are, we can take the calls, and if they're not, we'll just go on um, talking with my guest, Lyle, uh, about, um, well, both about his witness testimony, but also just about the perspective that we have as, um, as Jews who spent the first half of our lives in some sense in darkness, in a very real sense in darkness, and then came into the incredibly clear light of the Catholic Church. So um, with that, uh, I will, of course, I mean, we'll, I'll come back with Lyle, but I want to thank him for the beautiful exposition of his witness testimony that he gave. And um, I want to invite our listeners, if you wish, to call in during the break. And we'll be back in a few moments with more with Lyle. You're listening to Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism on Radio Maria with me, your host, Roy Showman, and our guest for today, another very enthusiastic Jewish entrant into the church, uh, Lyle. And with that, we'll be back in a few moments. Hi, welcome back. Uh, we don't seem to have gotten any calls during the break, so I will continue with our conversation with Lyle, but if you wish to call in with a question or a comment or to say something to me or Lyle, the number here is 866-333-6279 or 866-333-MARY, M-A-R-Y. Uh, well, my first question, Lyle, uh, if it's okay to ask, sure. um, is... <laughs> um, one of the, um, one, I mean, look, we, we both have a heart, obviously, for evangelizing, both for evangelizing Jews and for evangelizing Catholics as to what they have in the church. And um, I, th I find very often that Catholics aren't aware of just what a wasteland, what a desert it is, not to know the basic truths about the meaning of life, about God, about what God wants from us, about what happens after we die. So I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I want to ask you whether, you know, when you were younger, when you were a child or when you were a teenager, whether you struggled with a lack of answers in these, about these things. You know, it's an interesting point, but the answer to that is yes. 
And the reason I struggled with it is because, see, when the Old Testament ended, that was it. You only have that. So you say to yourself, all right, what now? And, and basically, it's as if the Lord had put you in a boat. You know, you're on the seashore. He puts you in the boat. He gives you a set of oars. And he pushes you out and said, goodbye, good luck, and have a nice day. And off you go. But Jesus didn't do that. And there, there's something that's it's lost. You don't have the answer. You're searching for an answer. But you have the answer in Jesus. Because you know what he said. You know what he promised. If you read it, it's clear. It's clear. Eternal life. Life with him. And it couldn't get better than that. So when you were growing up, did you did you think that there's a heaven and a hell? Did you think that there's some amorphous afterlife that we know nothing about it? Did you think you just are worm food in the ground? What did you think? Well, basically... You didn't know. I mean, yeah, there was, they talked about, if you figure, you heard of the expression, heaven, so you hope to get there. You know, the thing is that on Yom Kippur, and the image is, is painted, and as you read the, the readings in the liturgy, as the day is closing, you know, the, the day is coming to an end, the gates of heaven are closing, Lord, hear my prayer. And the visual image of this is that your prayer has got to get in before the gates of heaven are closed. Because if it doesn't, where are you? You're lost and you don't know. But Jesus is always there to give you the forgiveness. Always there to take you back no matter when, to your last breath. And that's the difference. You know. Before you didn't know anything. Truly, you didn't know anything. And you listened uh, to, to, to the rabbis as they talked about uh, at, at a you know, funeral, whatever, they're lost. Not that they're, that they're, not they're bad people. They're lost. They, they don't have the fullness of the truth as we do in Christ. I, um, I, I buried my mother recently, um, uh, m more recently than you did, but it, I don't want to go there now. That's not the point of the show, but it had a very happy ending. She did have a miraculous uh, conversion to Jesus on her deathbed. But, but, wow. um, uh, I'm actually jumping ahead. I had just about the, uh, when, when my mother was died and was buried, that was a Catholic burial. My father had died about two years earlier, and although he also had a miraculous conversion, Jesus actually appeared to him about two weeks before he died, and he was baptized, but he still had a Jewish funeral and burial because, frankly, first of all, all the arrangements had been made beforehand, <laughs> uh, and secondly, um, there, I don't want to say there wasn't time to tell the family, but there was just no way to do anything about it at, at that point. Um, and I remember the rabbi, who was a, a very sweet guy, you know, and he's standing there by the graveside. And it's about, it's almost as though the best he could do was say, as long as we live on in our loved one's memories, we're still alive kind of thing. I mean, it was such thin pap compared to the truth. I mean... Yeah, Th that's what, yeah. where comfort's supposed to come from. As long as my yeah. people remember me, I'm still alive somehow. When really, <laughs> really, just imagine yeah, at what some we. Point what... They're not going to know you anymore. Well, I mean, but, the family, you know, you, so many generations, they don't know who is the best anymore. But it, it, even if it were true, yeah. I mean, it's yeah. so thin compared to the reality that we are going to be in um, virtually ex eternal ecstasy in the immediate presence of God just flooded with love beyond imagining for all eternity. It would be like the greatest, if you could imagine the greatest day of your life and you multiplied that by 10 million, it wouldn't even be the tiniest of the amount of joy that you would have with Christ in heaven. It couldn't possibly compare. Absolutely. And, and um, so I guess the reason I went down this road is because, you know, a, a lot of Christians and a lot of Catholics do not want to offend people, and so they don't want to really talk too much about their faith, or they don't even want to acknowledge to themselves that um, there's something there that other people don't have that they really should share. And um, 
on the one hand, we should share the faith because we should help other people get to heaven and the sacraments help people get to heaven and, and having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ help people to get to heaven and knowing what we're supposed to do as laid out in the New Testament, help people get to heaven. But on top of that, the misery of simply not having the answers, of not knowing anything about what God wants or what waits for us after death and so forth. And I think that um, I kind of, I, I guess this is all an exhortation that um, w we who do know those things should let other people know not only for the implications for their eternal life, but so they can be happy in this life. Because it's much harder to be happy in this life if you, if you don't know what's awaiting us. Not only that, but if you, if you know Christ in the life, in this life, if you know, know him to the fullest, understand what's there, you know he'll help you through it. You can have a tough time. I mean, you know, as a believer, our lives are like anybody else's. We've gone through some bad, I've gone through some tough times. Yes, I have. And I don't know what the future is going to hold. I can't tell me what, you know, you can't say, well, two minutes, ten minutes from now, this is going to happen. Well, first, nobody knows that. But you know what's going to happen to you ten minutes from now. What I know is that he is with me through everything. And with him, because he is, I can go through things that you would I never, you never can believe you could go through. because you did strength. But not only that. It's, it's the joy of knowing it. And, Roy, I can tell you something. If you said to me, <clears throat> here, I would never trade you, never, the best day of my life without Jesus for the toughest day with him, I wouldn't take it. I wouldn't take it. Because he's gotten me through a lot of tough times. And uh, he'll do it again. And he's there. He's in ways I in ways I can't understand. But that doesn't mean anything. Just because I can't understand him doesn't mean that he's not there. You're not meant to. We're, like he said, my ways are not your ways. My ways are higher than your ways. He's quoted Isaiah saying that. And it's true. And what you don't understand doesn't mean he's not there. It means you don't understand it. I don't understand... Um, quantum physics it works you know it, it's there but i don't have to understand it but jesus is better yeah I, I often think it's so ironic that people uh uh i obviously try to evangelize when i can and some people basically kind of almost refuse to believe in god unless they first are in a position to understand why he does everything he does but meanwhile they're sitting in front of a television set and they have no idea on <laughs> earth how that television set even works much less how god works and why he does what he does it's you, you know, know i'm talking about a TV, I, i've got a podiatrist and I, I have conversations with him he's jewish and he knows he knows I'm, I'm catholic and i was jewish before he knows this so we talk about god we talk about jesus so he said to me, he said, you know, he said, really, this is one of the best proofs that you can have for that, that Christ is who he says he is, because there's an Israel today. And I said, okay, wonderful. So now that you know there's an Israel today, and the, the, the scripture talked about an Israel, so, so, what, what, what are you doing where you are? Come over. You can't do that. And he was telling me one day, I said, he was doing an operation on a foot, and he said, this was a complex operation. He said, you know, it's like everything just fell into place. He said, you, like, you couldn't believe it. This worked right, this worked right, this worked right, this worked right, and the, the surgery went well, better than I expected. I said, really? I said, how do you explain that? He said, you know, I don't know, like a force was there guiding me. And I said, well, do you think the force's name is God? He said, I'm not sure. Like, I almost fell out of a chair. You know, I mean, come on, what does it take? But you know, there are people who sincerely strive to learn. And he's one of the guys. But he can't, st he can't step over the line. He can't. And there's people like that. They get so close to it. And you say, come on, one more step. Take my hand. I'll get you over. And he won't put the hand out. Yeah. Yeah. 
let me uh, see something. I don't know whether um, uh, I, I can't tell whether we have a caller. Um, I guess we don't have a caller, or else I would. Okay. No. Um, you. Uh, I mean, I have nothing against spending all of our time talking about Jesus, but this is Radio Maria, so I wanted to ask you whether uh, the Blessed Virgin Mary entered your life too. Oh, Mama! <laughs> wow, the Blessed Mama. Did she ever enter my life? I always had a devotion. I always loved the Blessed Mother. I always did. But my devotion to her now is far greater than anything it has ever been. So and even as a Jew, you loved her? Oh, no, no. As a Jew, I didn't know her. Oh, okay. I, as a Jew, I never knew Mary. Okay. Um, Jesus was the best I ever heard of. And the example, like I say, he didn't draw me to, to do anything. But now, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you the story about one day when I was going to pick up my wife at work, the weather forecast was an extremely, extremely bad storm coming our way, and heavy snow, heavy winds, and so she worked the night shift. I said, you know, don't drive, because I'm better driving at night, I mean, this kind of weather than you are, so I'll take my car, it's bigger, and we'll do that. Okay. So I listen to the weather forecast, I look out the uh, window, you know, and I say, well, maybe it's not as bad as it is. I left early anyway. When I got out there, really, I understood what it was. The wind was blowing so hard and it's still coming down so fast that if a plow went by you one minute later, you would know it. Oh, I hate to do this to you. Me. Lyle, I, I'm yeah. not very good on my job, but I see we have a caller. Um, okay. So let's let's keep that as a cliffhanger. And is, okay. uh, are you there, Patricia? Uh, yes, yes, I'm here. Um, and did you have a Hello? question or a comment or? Well, it was um, a comment and a question. Um, the comment is uh, from from last week's show about uh, on the feast of the Immaculate Conception. Um, like the exactly what you read about uh, the meditation from Dom Geringer, that was the exact meditation that the priest had that morning for, for, for mass, like almost word for word. And this is the first time that I came to listen to the show. And it was, um, for me, it was, it was something, I don't know if it was like arranged by the Blessed Mother. And then the very next day in, at mass, he had the exact same, same comment again. But my, my comment is that, you know, I'm born and well, I'm uh, cradle Catholic, but like we were never really, um, you know, you were just taught pray your rosary, the Blessed Mother is the Mother of Christ, but her real role in salvation history and how she's such a mother to all of us, that was never emphasized. And uh, I think that's such a terrible thing for for us um, cradle Catholics that we get to miss out on on all the graces we could get from her. And then my question I was going to ask was, um, I think the um, guest started answering it already, was what is... His relationship with the Blessed Mother since coming into the Catholic Church. Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for the call. And um, uh, it speaks, <laughs> I'd hate to say this, it speaks well of your priest. I mean, I, I'm, it's wonderful that your uh, priest is um, drawing his uh, his homily from Dom Karen Jay. You, you can't do better than that. And um, I'm very happy with the providence that, that you heard it twice and... Um, it gave a kind of gave confirmation, and um, it was also <laughs> providence, obviously, that your question was just in the middle of being answered. So, so we kind of um, uh, put Lyle on hold in this cliffhanger when he's driving through this <laughs> blizzard, <laughs> saying something about the Blessed Virgin Mary. So, so why, so, what, what, where are so we anyway, going? Yeah, so all I could, so anyway, I, I was saying to the Lord, I said, Lord, you know, I've got three roads to go down. And I'll give you the names of the roads. It won't maybe not mean anything to you, but that's okay. But at least it gives you some idea. I said, I've got to go down Gulf, Milwaukee, Oakton, Milwaukee to Gulf. All are wide roads. All are straight. But the road that I'm afraid of is Gulf. And Gulf is because there's an S-curve. After you go, there's an entrance to the uh, toll road. Right immediately after that is an S-curve. And if the weather is bad, that's a tough curve to go around. So I'm thinking, I don't want to go there. And the Lord spoke to my heart. I mean, it's not like you hear a voice. But he spoke to my heart. He says, go, my son, I'm with you. Well, I'm going down Oakton, and it's okay. Not good driving, but it's, I'm, I can, I'm doing it. I'm going slow, but it's all right. I get down Milwaukee, 
and now I'm beginning to see, now it's getting worse. I mean, Milwaukee's really wide street. I can see very far, uh, both sides, what traffic is there, but I'm getting whiteouts. And maybe some people who listen to this program may not understand, but a whiteout condition when it snows is that the wind and the snow are coming down with such an intensity that everything is totally white. You have no reference points anymore. You don't know which is left, right, up, up, down. You know nothing. <clears throat> and the whiteouts on Milwaukee are coming, and I'm getting afraid. I mean, they're not lasting long, but I'm I'm getting afraid. I mean, I've driven in this all my life, so it, it takes a lot to make me afraid of the the weather. This did. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. And I'm starting to say the rosary, and I'm staying on the Hail Mary because I'm starting to be worried. And I'm getting toward golf. The whiteouts are coming. I said, uh, Lord, I don't want this. I don't want to go down golf. I don't want that S-curve. Go, my son. I am with you. Now I am on golf. And now the whiteouts are last coming frequently, and they're lasting longer. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. And I'm starting to say, Mama, I said, I need help. Mama Mary, I need help. Because this S-curve is coming up, Mother. I've never done this before like this, never. Never asked her for anything like this. I'm getting toward the point where that S-curve is coming up, and now it is a total whiteout. I can't turn. There's no place I could see to turn. And everything is just white. And I said, Mama Mary, I said, you got to help me. I said, because I can't go around that curve without turning the wheel, but I don't know when. So, Mother, I'm going to hold the wheel straight. I'm not going to turn it left or right until you tell me. I held the wheel totally straight. When I got it, when the snow lifted, the whiteness lifted, the whiteout was gone, I was on the other side of the S-curve, and I did not turn the wheel of the car. That's what Mama Mary did. She saved me. And since then, I know very well Mama Mary. I know her well. My devotion to her has increased beyond what it was before. And she's worthy of that. She brings people to her son. What greater gift can you have than the Blessed Mother doing that? To help you know Jesus. And boy, what a gift and what a treasure she is to, to, to know her. To see the love that she has. This love for every one of his of the children of God. Only you got to put out your hand and say, Mama, help me. Mama, if I don't understand, help me to understand, Mother. Help me to know about your son. Help me, Mama Mary. She'll do it. And that'll be the greatest gift. Be a gift you can't imagine. The best gift for Christmas. To know with Jesus. Oh, uh, she gave us Jesus uh, uh, for Christmas already. She can do it again. Right? <laughs> it was you get Jesus her. again for Christmas, right? Again for Christmas, just like she did. Right. You the, know, the, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Two thousand years ago, um, the uh, we're in the last uh, last two minutes or so of the show, so I um, <laughs> I know that you came through the charismatic renewal. How about leading us in a kind of, fair, you know, sign-off prayer? Okay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Blessed Lord, we come to tell we love you, we bless you, we praise you, we honor you, we give you glory. This glory you're richly deserved, we're so grateful to give. We thank you for your gifts. Every gift you've given us is a wonderful gift that we don't deserve or earn, but out of your goodness and love you give it to us. We thank you for the greatest gift of all, your blessed Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for your mother who leads us to her, to him. Blessed Lord, as the people are searching this holiday season, touch their hearts. Help them to see Jesus. Let them understand the joy that is Jesus. Let this word spread throughout the world. Help the people who are blind and don't see. Help them, the ones who are, whose hearts are hardened. Touch them. To those who are sick, heal them in mind and body. Touch them. To the people who think this whole world is nothing but power, and they have power and influence, it's everything. Help them to see only you are worth having. 
because the power and influence will die with them in the grave. But you will live on, and they could live on in you. Help them to see, Lord. Help them to see. Help them to know. Help them understand. Mother, Mama Mary, help them as well. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Father, and the Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for for your um, everything, for your beautiful witness testimony and for your exhortation, for your evangelization. Somehow I have a feeling that as you go through your day in the workaday world, you are still evangelizing. I can't imagine that not being the case, given the way you speak. <laughs> and uh, so thank you very much for coming on. And I want to thank, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity, Roy. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I have to shut you off or else I'm afraid next week it'll be your show. Um, and they'll, they'll just say, well, we've had enough of you. Why, where, what's this guy Lyle's number? <laughs> anyway, I, it would not be such a bad move for the station to make, but maybe, maybe they'll hold off a while. In any case, I want to thank you so much for coming on. I want to thank our listeners for having been uh, with us. I want to, of course, with, wish everyone a wonderful end of Advent and coming up Christmas. And not that I won't be here, but just because um, it's uh, on all of our thoughts now. And um, so it's time to say goodbye for now, and I hope you join okay. us again next week, same time, same place, for Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism, on Radio Maria. Bye for now. Bye. Nice.